never really expected to be following these birds migrating for an active conflict zone. Um, the main purpose of the study was to try and understand um, their movements and what resources they were using. Um, but when the news broke in, in February about um, Russia invading Ukraine, um, we were kind of watching um, the news kind of unfold and thinking about the fact that our, our birds were about to fly through there on their, their spring migration. In February 2022, Russia invaded Ukraine, triggering a war which has had a devastating impact on the people, the environment and wildlife. Prior to the conflict, a small team from the University of East Anglia in the United Kingdom and the British Trust for Ornithology had been tracking the migrations of the endangered Greater Spotted Eagle using the very latest in GPS tracking technology. With the kit still active on these majestic birds, the team have been able to study the impact of the conflict on their behaviour. The results have been featured widely in many articles and in a lot of mainstream media. So it's a real honour to have the lead author of the study, Charlie Russell, a postgraduate researcher at the University of East Anglia, join me today. Oh, well, I've, I've always been um, passionate about birds from a young age, you know, going out, um, watching barn owls and kestrels near where I used to live, and then being involved in falconry. And when I kind of learned about, you know, um, the threats that birds are facing in the wild, that was something that kind of shaped my career. I realized it was kind of a job helping wild birds out there. And that's suddenly what I, I wanted to do. Um, and I went to, to university, studied wildlife conservation, uh, undergraduate and started to get really into my migration patterns and um, using tracking data to understand those. Um, and I think, um, yeah, tracking data has kind of revolutionized our, our ability to study animals, particularly when they're difficult to observe. Um, and kind of one of my favorite kind of examples of, of tracking studies is some of the early work with um, seals, where you can see um, tracking devices kind of mounted to their heads and they have the little antenna sticking out and they kind of look like unicorns. <laughs> Um, and, and yeah, I've been working with tracking data since then. And you're currently, um, studying for a PhD, is that right? Uh, yeah. So I'm a PhD student at the University of East Anglia and I'm kind of specializing in understanding, uh, migration patterns in kind of between Europe and, and Africa, um, particularly for greater spotted eagles to understand what kind of threats they're encountering and what we can do to try and, and mitigate those. And. Um... Here on the screen, we've got an example of um, a migration pattern. Can you talk us through and show us what, what we're looking at here? Yeah, so, so this is tracking data for 23 of our, our great spotted eagles. Um, and they breed in um, southern Belarus. There's a large wetland area there called Polisha. Um, and every year, um, around kind of September, October, they'll leave their breeding grounds and migrate south. So the females make these uh, really long migrations to Greece, around the coastal wetlands there. And the males will fly several thousand kilometers further to a, a wetland in, around kind of Sudan and South Sudan in Eastern Africa before returning again to the breeding grounds um, in sort of April. Um, here we've got an animation here of, of um, a number of events um, to do during uh, related to that conflict. Could you tell us what, what's um what's happening here yeah so we never really expected to be following these birds migrating for an active conflict zone um the main purpose of the study was to try and understand um their movements and what resources they were using um but when the news broke in in february about um russia invading ukraine um we were kind of watching um the news kind of unfold and thinking about the fact that our our birds were about to fly through there on their their spring migration. And so um, the invasion actually um, was very intense uh, at the start. There was lots of kind of artillery fire and, and shelling in major cities um, in Ukraine throughout March and April. And a lot of that was um, spread throughout in some of the rural areas as well. Um, and the conflict was affecting kind of central and western Ukraine, where our birds were were migrating through. So talk to us a little bit about the technology that's enabled you to get such interesting data and, and visibility. Um, I think this is an example of, of something that you've used. So talk to us through how you go about choosing devices, choosing software, 
um, and then and then um, implementing it on the birds. Yeah, well, uh, the tracking technology that we use has changed a lot over the last uh, couple of decades since it was first kind of introduced, uh, working with kind of animal tracking. And one of the big things um, is the size of the devices that we use. And especially with birds, this is generally the main limiting factor in what devices we can use. So there's a general rule of thumb um, that we try to use uh, tracking devices that weigh less than 3% of the bird's total body weight so that it has less of an impact on their flight and their movements, and you're not kind of overburdening the animal. Um, so for our great spotted eagles, we'll be using tracking devices around 30 grams. And the question then is, is what sort of technology you can fit in that? Um, and so the trackers that we used um, are Ornatella tags. Um, they collect GPS um, locations every up to every five minutes. We can program them as well um, with things like a geofence. So we can collect higher resolution data during the breeding period, which is what we were focusing on, um, and lower resolution during the migration. Um, and then it's, it's yeah, generally about, you know, the battery life, how long these things last. You'll see they're all fitted with solar panels. Um, so some of our devices were put on birds in 2017 and they're still collecting data. Um, so wow. they're really robust and, and long lasting. So what exactly do these devices do in terms of um, transmitting information? Um, are you using mobile phone networks um, to transmit the data? How, how is that transmit, uh, data transmitted back to you? Yeah, so um, it can work in, in different ways. So uh, when you look at some of the smaller tags that we use, um, sending data back um, is actually very battery intensive. Um, so some tags, especially the smaller ones, are archival tags, so you have to retrieve them. For the devices that we're using, um, the um, device will send it back through the satellite network um, into a repository for us. Um, some devices will alternatively use um, mobile phone masts and kind of the GSM network to uh, send those transmissions back. And once you've got the data, um, how is it stored? Uh, do you keep it in Excel spreadsheets or um, do you have a data warehouse? How, how do you store the information? Yeah, there are lots of different formats you can use for, uh, for tracking data. Uh, we use a, a data repository called MoveBank, which is quite popular. Um, and this is kind of an online site. You can look at it yourselves, actually, and, you know, you can get one and see a huge range of different studies um, uploading their data on there every day and the movements of loads of different species. Um, and this data, you can normally um, access this as um, kind of CSV files. So an Excel sheet with the uh, location, the timestamp, and also a whole host of other bits of information in that so they can record things like the altitude, temperature, some devices will have accelerometry data in them, um, and you can pair that with environmental data as well, and uh, information like uh, the number of satellites each fix had, which gives you an idea of how accurate they are. Um, and so we can get a huge amount of data from this. So let's take a look at how you begin to put the tracker onto an eagle. So here's a, a graphic. Talk us through what we're looking at here with the, this seems to be an eagle and, and it's a, an illustration of how you plan to put the device on. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, so if you look across the, the top row, we have several different kind of profiles for, for the bird. Um, and you can kind of see how we generally fit uh, what we call a backpack harness. And so the device will sit kind of between the shoulder blades on the back of the bird roughly. Um, and then you have a Teflon strap, which comes round um, the head, is connected together at kind of the chest and then loops back underneath the wings and connects to the device. And it's almost exactly the same as a person kind of wearing a backpack. Um, and this is a very commonly used method for fitting them. Some people also use things like leg loops. Um, so if you look across the bottom row, it's the same sort of, of mechanism, but a little bit lower down on the back. And this um, some people argue that, that this reduces the amount of drag that the birds experience from the tracking device um, by placing it in a different position. So the, the manufacturers of these devices, in terms of things like drag, are they able to test that or simulate that in any way? Or is it done 
just through trial and error? So generally, it's, it's a little bit of common sense that a more kind of rounded, sloped profile will be better in terms of drag on the device. But sometimes this, this means adding a little bit more size to the device. Um, there's been some papers actually that are really interesting using captive birds in uh, things like wind tunnels to look at kind of the aerodynamics of flight in different positions. But this varies a lot across different species. Um, different bird species have lots of different kind of morphologies, different types of, of behavior and flying. For example, they can be kind of flapping in powered flight, they can be soaring or kind of stooping. And this is an area actually where um, I'm conducting some ongoing research to try and understand the impacts that these tags have on birds. And so that's investigating things like the shape of the device, where they're fitted and how heavy they are. Um, using captive birds, uh, bird or prey centers in the UK to try and improve um, the design of devices for, for future use. Interesting. So here we can see a picture of um, a device. Tell us what's happening here. It looks like it's requiring several pairs of hands to um, to fit this tracker. Yeah, so when you work with um, wild birds or even captive birds generally, they're not, you know, exceptionally happy at the prospect of having a tracking device put on them. Um, they don't really know what's going on. Um, and so you typically have one individual that casts the bird or holds them still. You can kind of see there as well that the bird has a hood on. And so what that is, it's kind of like a little hat on their head um, that acts like a, a little blindfold. And so it helps to keep them calm and they're less worried about different stresses and stimuli around them. And, and yeah, um, it's generally a, a, a little bit of a, a two-person job to fit these devices. So you can see an Ornatella device being fitted to the back there. Um, and what they're doing at the end is just kind of tying off um, the Teflon straps at the back so that it's held in place. Do these devices have any LEDs or anything externally that, um, or, or make a noise, to anything that could disturb the bird? We generally try and, and keep that to, to a minimum. Most tracking devices are, are designed to kind of um, look very kind of plain and, and boring. You know, you don't want to make uh, individuals stand out, uh, especially for prey species that might make them more vulnerable to predators. Um, and so you can see the devices we're using a, a brown like the bird. Um, and, and that's quite typical for what's available. So in, in my world where... We're using devices to track cargo and shipments and packages. Um, we we associate a device ID with a shipment ID, and, and we know some characteristics of the shipment. Um, what do you do with regard to eagles, and how do you correlate or match your tracker device IDs with, with characteristics of the birds? Yeah, so... Um... Every tracking device we deploy has, has an ID number. Um, and, and when it's deployed on a bird, we, we normally know which individual that is. And oftentimes that, that involves kind of giving them kind of a nickname. Um, so um, if you look at the, the work with General Great Spotted Eagles, um, we talk about an individual named Denisa and, and Borovets, which just helps them be more identifiable to us. And then other data we collect for those birds can be matched with the tracking data. Um, and so things like camera trap data from, from the nests, uh, we can identify um, when they're bringing prey items back to the nest to feed their chicks. Um, so we can understand from their movements whether they're foraging in a certain habitat or area and what prey they're then bringing back from that, which helps us to understand um, their foraging behaviours. Um, as well as things like breeding success. Um, and we can investigate all of these, these metrics and build up a really complete profile um, for what these birds are doing throughout their lives. So you've enabled the birds They've got the devices on. Uh, you've checked to make sure they're, they're working. We now look at some of the data that you've got here. Um, now, am I right in thinking that the, the um, you got the data back from the tracker and what was interesting was the stops, the location of stops and duration of stops made by tracked individual birds yeah that was one of the key findings um for our work um stopovers are a really important part of migration um you can you know it's a 
incredible natural phenomena and, and feat for these birds to fly thousands of kilometers every year. And you can kind of liken that to, to running a marathon. But, but during that, you do need to stop, you do need to rest, recover your energy, shelter from poor weather conditions, perhaps. Um, and so these stopover sites are really important for that. So in, in normal years for their migration before the Russian invasion, we found that there were kind of three main stopover sites and that collectively about 90% of the, the tracked eagles were using these stopover sites before they returned to their breeding grounds. But um, during the spring migration of 2022, this drastically reduced. Only 33% of individuals were um, using those stopover sites. And you can see um, that this was kind of more towards the south of Ukraine as well, where conflict was less intense. Um, and so we see this big drop off in terms of stopover sites impacting their ability to, to refuel on migration. Yeah, it seems this middle bit here um southwest of kiev seems to have changed a lot and, and this element here pre-conflict just on this border mm. is is that the border is that a border with uh romania there or um moldova uh it's near near both borders um, yeah yeah so the other um graphic we've got was um a root of a specific uh bird um i've I can't remember what this bird is called. Was it um De this is Denisa? Denisa, that's correct. Yeah. Um, describe to us what we're looking at here with this information. Yeah. So um, what we can see is is that during Denisa's uh, spring migration in in twenty twenty two, as she was approaching Kiev, she made a stopover. Um, before then, continuing north on her journey, um, she was exposed to several different conflict events in that time and so you can see these marked in kind of the red uh, and kind of orange colors when you follow the track northwards um and so what you can also see is that there's sort of a, a westward curve um kind of near kiev and so that's when she was exposed to different conflict events en route um making these kind of deviations skirting the edge of the conflict around kiev um overall kind of moving westwards before making another stopover site um, and then heading north towards the the breeding grounds and have you got um any data any up-to-date data or are you still compiling information about the the migration and the duration of stopovers of, of birds uh yeah we're still collecting this data actively and, and looking at it um but for most of our birds um they migrate through central and western ukraine where the conflict is now, relatively speaking, less intense. Um, and so we're not seeing this same effect in subsequent years. But we do know that the breeding population in, in Polisia and other parts of Europe, um, those birds are still migrating through more intense parts of conflict in, in eastern Ukraine. And there are small numbers of, of individuals that breed in Ukraine that will still be exposed to these disturbances and likely still be affected by them. This really interesting information has obviously been observed because you were already tracking the birds. Um, in general, what are the the main reasons to to track birds? You know, whether it's falcons or eagles or or, or any other bird. What why do it? What what is the value? Um, how how can that um, data be used um, generally? Yeah, so there's there's a few different kind of applications for for tracking devices. Um, one that the general public might be familiar with is as kind of measures against poaching or persecution. And so you might be familiar with, to say, elephants or, or rhinos or, or lions in Africa that wear GPS devices, so the rangers know where they are um, and can help to kind of monitor them and, and keep them safe. Um, what we do with our research. Um, is more about trying to understand their movements and behavior. Um, and when you, you think about migratory species and the distances they're traveling, we can't observe them for that period. We don't know where they're going or what they're using. If the individuals that we see in Polisha are the same individuals as we see in Sudan, for example, with the great spotted eagles. And so tracking data helps us to understand where they are and what, what resources they're using. And that can inform uh, global prioritization 
for conservation efforts, what areas we need to protect to keep the species safe. And then you can also apply this on a more local scale. Um, and so we're looking at, at habitat use, particularly around wetland areas, um, because great spotted eagles are, are wetland specialists. Um, and so we want to check these weapons that they're dependent on. And tracking data can help us to justify um, why this is important for the species. So we can see the value of the data. Um, what can go wrong? Like um, you've, you've done a lot of these projects. Um, it requires um, humans to, to, um, to put the technology on, on, on the animal. What are the kind of things that can go wrong or some of the mistakes that um, can be made um, trying to do this? Yeah, well, well the big thing is, is once you've released that bird, um, you fit the device, you've released that bird, it, it's gone. Your chances of recapturing it are very, very slim, depending on the species, of course. Um, and so everything has to kind of be right first time. And, and so this is, is thinking about things like how, when you fit the, the tracking device is getting the fit right so that it stays in the right position. It's not causing any discomfort for the birds. Um, that's quite difficult to, to get right first time. It takes a little bit of practice. Um, and yeah, when they're gone, um, devices can fail. Uh, and, that, and that happens. Um, you don't really get to understand why that happens. It could be something to do with the the kind of the device hardware failing it could be that the solar panels have become obscured by feathers or kind of you know being blocked so the batteries aren't recharging or it could be you know as serious as the birds have died um and subsequently the tracking device is no longer collecting data um and so there are lots of things to kind of be aware of once the the device is is deployed um and that you have to think about what's interesting is to think within ornithology um or, or you know wider wildlife conservation you've seen probably quite a lot of progress made in the technology and it's enabled you know better and more detailed monitoring and observations of of eagles and other birds what are the kind of product developments you're hoping to see over the next few years um, and, and, and how would they help you get more data um, to make more kind of analysis? Yeah, well, as I kind of touched on earlier, um, size is, is one of the big factors um, with tracking devices on, on birds. We want to make sure that we're not negatively impacting them or if we are, that this is, is minimal. Um, and as the size of devices you know, decreases and we can get this technology smaller, we can also fit more in it. Um, and that includes uh, things like accelerometers, um, exactly the same as you might have in, in your phone to measure your steps. Um, you can fit these devices inside the tracking devices on, on birds. And that can give us a huge amount of information about um, their behavior. So they can tell us whether they're standing up or sitting down. Sometimes it can even pick up things like vocalizations if they're calling and throwing their head back in a certain position. But it can also tell us how they're flying, you know, um, whether they're flapping or gliding at certain points. And that opens up a, a huge amount of, of knowledge about the animal's behavior that we can then use. But I, I think the most important thing is, is applying these devices ethically. There are, are thousands of, of tracking devices that have been deployed on birds worldwide. Um, and it's amazing. It's really pushed ornithological research forwards uh, and improved our understanding um, of bird populations and, and why they're declining. But when we're, we're putting these devices on birds, they, they do impact them. Um, and what we want is to get the most for that impact. It's not really fair on the birds if they're wearing these devices and the data is collected and it's never used or it's not used to its full potential. And so with the data that already exists, I think there's so much kind of research and collaboration that can be done. Um, and I think just you being transparent about this, um, and fostering kind of collaborations with people is really important to make the most of the data that's already out there, um, just as, as much as it is um, with developing new devices. We need to be making sure they, they're used to their full potential. So, Charlie, you've... Um... Obviously, uh, have a reputation and expertise um, 
tracking uh, these majestic eagles and falcons. If there was any animal in the world or creature in the world that you would like to do um, a tracking project on, what, what would it be? Oh, well, that's a very tough question. Bearded vultures are my favourite species of bird. I'd love to work with them one day, but I might take it back to seals. I think exploring um, tracking devices in that completely different marine environment, you still have that kind of vertical element with, with the depth and the diving behaviours, and they're just really, really cute. Um, so I think they'd be fun to work with. Charlie, if anyone wanted to speak to you or, or contact you uh, with regard to their own um, plans for wildlife tracking or, or to speak to you more about your project, how can they get in touch with you? Yeah, um, people are, are free to, to drop me an email anytime. I will talk for hours and hours about birds. So if that's something that you're interested in, let me know. Um, but yeah, just drop me an email. Um, my email address is charlie.russell at uea.ac.uk, but I'm sure there'll be a link in the description. So absolutely massive uh, shout out to Charlie there. He was a really brilliant guest. I uh, was very generous with his time. And yeah, take a look down in the description below for the links to his website and the websites of the study um, at the University of East Anglia. Yeah, so Charlie, thanks again. That was really interesting. And, um, you know, there's there's more to the tracking of stuff than just, you know, things in the material world. I mean, or when you say you use tracking technology, it all sounds a little bit James Bond or a little bit, uh, shadowy. Uh, the reality is there's some really good applications of the technology far away from logistics or the world of security and certainly within animal conservation and wildlife protection there's some real interesting applications of trackers and some companies who specialize in the development of um, devices for those applications, um, you probably never hear of them. And in fact, some of them mentioned by Charlie, I'd never heard of. But there's some really good gadgets there. Okay, well, look, that's the end of this episode. In the next episode, I'm going to start with a little bit of kind of background information on tracking, um, show some of the devices that I've been using over the last 20 years from my uh, tracking device museum. So until next time, take care.